fresh chicken. I mean, you see fresh chicken. Well, you can have chicken at 26 degrees Fahrenheit for a year and still sell it as fresh chicken on the label. Uh, what I've learned in my life is there's just almost nothing you can trust in labels. I mean, I remember the day, the day that I found the uh, low calorie tuna, tuna tins. And uh, the only difference between the high calorie and the low calorie or the high fat, low fat uh, tin was the serving size. The ingredients were identical. They just changed the serving size. So now it's low calorie, boom, you know. I mean, that kind of shysterism is on labels. And, and you know, people say, read label, read label, read label. You know, I've got to admit, I'm not a label reader. I don't even want to buy it with that kind of label on it. And so my effort has been trying to get us weaned from trusting labels and going to food items that don't even have a label. From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. Hey, Hilda here. Antibiotic, hormone, and GMO-free. Natural, organic, free-range, grass-fed. It's daunting to just make sense of the labels on the food we encounter, let alone actually pick the best foods to eat. This is episode 264, and our guests today are Joel Salatin and Dr. Sina McCullough. Joel is the trailblazing farmer from Polyface Farms at the forefront of regenerative farm practices, and Sina has a PhD in nutrition, and today with them we discuss their new book, Beyond Labels. Joel and Sina offer practical tips for decoding food labels and using that knowledge to get back to a real food diet. They also offer first steps for listeners on a budget or limited time. Because let's be honest, finding the time and the money to provide nourishing foods for ourselves and our families is a challenge in the modern world. Joel and Sina offer plenty of pointers on how to navigate just that. The food scene, from grocery stores to small farms to your own kitchen, to make clean, real food a regular part of the diet and achieve optimal health. Before we get into the conversation, I want to personally invite you to the Wise Traditions Conference. Yes, you can swing it. You can come for just a day, two days, or all three. There's a kids program so your kids will have fun while you learn from the best speakers and eat the most nutrient-dense food you've probably ever had in your entire life. That is no exaggeration. The dates are November the 13th to the 15th and will be in Atlanta, Georgia. Go to wisetraditions.org and sign up today. Do it now because early bird pricing is still in effect for just a short time. And I hope to see you there. This episode is brought to you in part by Bovine Tracheal Cartilage by Ancestral Supplements. Ancestral Supplements makes New Zealand sourced nose to tail organ meats, bone marrow, and bovine tracheal cartilage in simple convenient gelatin capsules. Bovine tracheal cartilage has unique and powerful effects on wound healing, immune conditions, joint health, and other conditions considered to be treatment-resistant to conventional therapies. And bovine tracheal cartilage provides concentrated amounts of connective tissue, immunoregulators, and cartilage building blocks that are now missing from the modern diet. So visit ancestralsupplements.com to see what they can do for you. Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world left out. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Joel and Sina. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Yeah, thank you. So you just wrote Beyond Labels, and when I saw that title, I have to be honest with you. I was like, wait, don't people know this by now? Don't they know we should all be eating whole, real, organic foods? Well, my answer to that would be no. <laughs> there, I think there is a small group of people that, and it's a growing group, that knows to eat whole, real, organic foods, but there's a lot of people who don't. Some of these people, either they're not paying attention, sometimes it's considered a political issue where it's typical for like a Republican or conservative to think that um, eating organic is something that a liberal does. And so they don't want to have any part of it. I have a lot <laughs> of friends that fit in that category. <laughs> there's also uh, a generational difference. So like my parents, for instance, don't feel like food has anything to do with health, that food is basically a source of calories. Whereas then you go to millennials and they're, they're starting to now understand that food 
is intricately tied to your health. So there's also the generational difference. And there's also the problem that the labels on our food are actually somewhat deceptive in the sense that they just tell one side of the story. And that's the story that the manufacturer wants you to hear. And so you go in the store and you see these labels that are brightly colored and you know, they're inviting, you know, they're happy colors. And you see pictures of farms and chickens out on, on grass, out on the pasture. And um, it's really easy to believe that all those foods can still provide you with health benefits um, and that they're actually not harmful to you. So I would say no, that not everybody knows that at this point. However, more and more people are realizing it. And in fact, when people um, are coming to this realization, the top question that I'm asked is, well, where do I actually start to make changes? Um, because it's so overwhelming out there. There's so many different diets, like paleo, vegan, Whole30. Mm -hmm. And there's so much conflicting dietary advice, you know, like even something like kale, we think of it as good one day, the next day it has high levels of thallium that can cause thyroid disease. You know, one day eggs are good, next day they're bad. Now they're good again. <laughs> so <laughs> so there's, it's, there's a lot of conflicting information. People often don't know where to start. And so that's one of the reasons that we wrote this book was to actually pull that curtain, you know, open and show you what's behind these labels so that you can figure out which foods you want to eat that are going to provide you with healing and that you can frankly not get ripped off in the grocery store, you know, by buying these more expensive foods that are claiming to have all these health benefits and some of them really don't. So no, I don't think everybody knows, but that's one reason why I wrote the book. And Joel, who were you thinking of when you wrote this book or decided to go in on this book with Sina? Sure. Who I was thinking of were, for example, all the people that think organic means that there's no factory farming, that tomatoes are raised in compost. The fact is that, you know, 95% of all organic or government certified organic eggs are raised in factory houses. 50% of all organic feedstuffs coming into the United States come through Istanbul, Turkey. Constant fraud. There's ongoing fraud there uh, routinely. They think free-range chicken means chickens are out on pasture. No, uh, that's not the case. Uh, they actually think that you know the FDA is checking things and um, generally regarded as safe. GRAS, grass, is applied to many things that have never been tested either singly or in the cocktail that they're normally used in. Whenever the FDA tests a substance, they only test for that particular substance, not that substance in partnership with other substances. And of course, no substance is used by itself. It's always in partnership, you know, mm -hmm. uh, whatever, red dye, 20, red dye 29 is not by itself. It's in there with, um, you know, MSG or, you know, some other thing. And so fresh chicken, I mean, you see fresh chicken. Well, you can have chicken at 26 degrees Fahrenheit for a year and still sell it as fresh chicken on the label. Uh, what I've learned in my life is there's just almost nothing you can trust in labels. I mean, I remember the day, the day that I found the uh, low calorie tuna, tuna tins. Yeah. And uh, the only difference between the high calorie and the low calorie or the high fat, low fat uh, tin was the serving size the ingredients were identical they huh? just changed the they just changed the serving size so now it's low calorie boom you know i mean that kind of shysterism mm -hmm. uh is on labels and and you know people say read label read label read label you know i've got to admit i'm not a label reader i don't even want to buy it with that kind of label on it and so my effort has been trying to get us weaned from trusting labels and going to food items that don't even have a label. I mean, and at our farm, we've actually gone that route. You know, we don't, we don't make any claim on our stuff. It's just polyface chicken, polyface eggs. Poly, you know, we don't say they're grade A. We don't say they're large, small. We, we don't say they're past. <laughs> we, don't, we don't say they're GMO free. We don't, we don't say anything. And, and what we do is we, we depend on our messaging and our transparency to fill in those gaps for us. Yeah, you know what's crossing my mind right now is how our whole society wants to be label free. Like, in other words, don't peg me as a Mexican woman or, you know what I mean? Like people want to be accepted for who they are. Isn't it interesting that uh, you're advocating for a way of eating that is 
label free. Exactly. And I was going to say that that's a whole nother level that we address in this book. Like Beyond Labels doesn't just apply to the food labels because we want to help you achieve your ultimate goal of health and wellness. And just going beyond the food labels isn't going to get you there. So we have this other facet of the book where we actually strive to help you free yourself from the many labels that we all have adopted in our lives. Those are the labels that can actually keep you sick or keep you from experiencing optimal health and wellness. So I'll give you an example. In the book, we talk about how there's labels even in the health and nutrition field. So for example, oftentimes if someone is trying to achieve optimal health, it's common to turn to diets like paleo or keto or specific carbohydrate. But what Joel and I are saying is those diets are actually just another type of label that promote conformity over individuality. And if you lock yourself into that one type of diet, you can actually become more focused on adhering to that man-made construct than to listening to your own body's innate intelligence. So it's what you're saying. In essence, you become a slave to the confinements and the limiting beliefs of that particular dietary protocol. Also, by outsourcing your authority to the experts who created that diet, you tend to silence your instincts. Mm -hmm. So instead of living inside that box, we walk you through a process to help encourage you to harness your innate power by teaching you how to listen to your own body. So in essence, we're actually helping you become your own healing expert. Wow, I love that. I love that. Sounds very empowering. And so you've addressed a little bit of this, but I wanted to ask Joel as well. What do you think that your book addresses, Joel, that has been missing in our understanding of how to best nourish ourselves? Yeah, I I think that, you know, people want a very simple recipe. You know, most of us, (laughs) give me the the list of do's and don'ts. Yeah. Um, Give me the, the accepted and the unacceptable. And, um, and, you know, we'll go on. The, the tension that Sina and I had writing this book was we wanted it to be helpfully simple, and there's an elegance in that, but the tension is then becoming so, so whatever, wishy-washy about, you know, that some things are good and some things are bad, uh, that, that you then you don't say anything. So that's why, that's why we go in the book, we go so far beyond from the way you view your personhood how do you affirm yourself uh, in, in the mirror? And, and we go pretty far afield in discussing things like hydration, sleep, goodness, forgiveness, okay? I mean, these are all, these are all way beyond just seeing if there's MSG in my sausage. Mm. And I mean, I don't know that we've hit the perfect balance, but uh, our feedback has been that it's, it's very helpful in in going a little farther afield in talking about health in a more comprehensive, eclectic way than just a series of recipes. Yeah, and if I could add to that, that's one of the beauties of the book. And that's why I wanted to partner with Joel on this book is because this is, to our knowledge, this is the first time in history that a farmer and a doctor have come together (laughs) to really explain full circle what is in the food, what's happening with the farming industry, and how all of that applies to you and your individual health. So we actually connect all those dots for you. And then we take it a step further than that. Like, I think the beauty of the book is also that the how component, like there's so many books and so many organizations that are saying, okay, eat organic and eat fresh from the farm, right? I mean, that's a dime a dozen at this point. And to your point, these these people who are ready to do that, they already know you should be eating whole, real organic foods, right? But for the people who aren't there yet, they need these simple steps. They need the how. And so that's what we do is, you know, using both of our expertise, we combine them together to explain to you why to do it. But then we give you a really simple, like, At the most, it's usually a paragraph on how to actually implement that step in your life. So we really break it down and make it easier for you. And, you know, um, to our earlier point about people eating whole, real organic foods, even I know that that's the way that, you know, our bodies are designed to eat. And that is the quickest path to optimal health is eating whole, real organic foods. But I still on occasion, we'll eat processed foods. So it's even important for somebody who's already bought into that whole um, lifestyle that they understand which processed foods are going to be more healing and which ones are going to be less healing. Sina, perhaps the best example of that is um, polyface hot dogs. 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Joel and I joke because um, Polyface hot dogs are the only hot dogs that I allow my children to eat. <laughs> ah. And it's because of the ingredients. And so, you know, I mean, what kid doesn't love hot dogs, right? I was raised on hot dogs too. And 4th of July is around the corner. So um, what I did was I brought my kids to the grocery store and I showed them the ingredient labels of all these different types of hot dogs and ex- did product comparisons in essence, you know, explained mm-hmm. what these ingredients really mean. Then I showed them the ingredients in the polyphase hot dog. And obviously, you know, there's nothing in that that I wouldn't eat myself. So we cooked them on the grill and we even did a side-by-side comparison, you know, taste test. They loved these hot dogs so much. You can taste the difference. Like you can taste it doesn't have these artificial ingredients and these dyes and meat glues in them. And so my kids love them so much that Polyface Farms is about an hour and a half for me. They are willing to sit in the car for a three hour round trip just to go to the farm to get these hot dogs. Coming up, Joel and Sina cover how to avoid antibiotics in our food, even when eating out. And they offer practical tips for transitioning to a clean, real, whole food diet. You're listening to the Wise Traditions Podcast from the Weston A. Price Foundation. We pause now to recognize our sponsors. Thanks to many people just like you, North Star Bison is celebrating over 25 years of healing the land and feeding people well. Their focus from day one at North Star has been to raise meat as nature intended to regenerate vital native habitats that sink mega amounts of carbon, which improve air and water quality, and support native wildlife, trillions of insects, and even fish, all while providing nutrient-rich, deeply nourishing foods that taste amazing and leave us feeling satisfied. At North Star, they even field harvest their animals to respect and preserve the dignity of life, as well as provide the tender, superior quality of product that nature intends. At North Star Bison, their flagship product is their 100% grass-fed and finished bison, but their offerings have grown to include Rocky Mountain elk, 100% grass-fed and finished beef and lamb, rabbit, pastured corn and soy-free pork, corn and soy-free chicken and turkey, 100% grass-fed raw cheeses, wild Alaskan sockeye salmon, raw pet foods, and so much more. Our family recently got an order. And we are just head over heels in love with North Star Bison. Their products are top-notch, as they say, and the taste is delicious. So order from them today. Go to NorthStarBison.com and spend over 250 and get free shipping. And feel free to use the code WAPF at checkout to get an additional 10% off your order. Again, go to NorthStarBison.com and rediscover food as nature intended. And this episode is brought to you in part by Bovine Tracheal Cartilage by Ancestral Supplements. Ancestral Supplements makes New Zealand sourced, nose to tail, organ meats, bone marrow, and bovine tracheal cartilage in simple, convenient gelatin capsules. The life work of Dr. John F. Pruden showed that bovine tracheal cartilage had unique and powerful effects on wound healing, immune conditions, joint health, and other conditions considered to be treatment resistant to conventional therapies. All of these conditions were immune in nature, with the exception of the wound healing studies. According to Dr. Pruden, bovine cartilage closely resembles fetal mesenchyme, the primordial tissue from which muscle, bone, tendons, ligaments, skin, fat, and bone marrow, the heart of the immune system, all develop. Bovine tracheal cartilage provided concentrated amounts of connective tissue, immunoregulators, and cartilage building blocks that are now missing from the modern diet. So visit ancestralsupplements.com to see what they can do for you. Ancestral supplements, putting back in what the modern world left out. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. That's amazing. And I love that you guys are so practical in your book too, going back to your point, Sina, about the how-tos, because I feel like all the head information in the world is useless if we don't know how to apply it to our lives. So I wanted to go there now and ask you guys some questions, some specific how-tos from your book. Like you talk about in your book, you know, avoiding antibiotics when we eat out. How the heck do we do that? And maybe number one, back up and tell us how are there antibiotics in the food when we're eating out? The inconvenient truth, (laughs) if I may use that phrase, is that as much as Americans talk about drugs and pharmaceuticals, we actually use twice as many in our animal industry 
than we do in our human industry. Twice as <laughs> and, many. Yeah. And, and so think about all the drugs that are coming through your pharmacy at your local, you know, Walgreens or, or whatever, uh, CVS, and, um, and twice as many are going across the counter into our farms. And, and not only that, but of course, many of the herbicides have antibiotic tendencies. And Cena could break that down a little more of the chemistry for us, but there are very close cousins of chemical compounds in the whole litany of, you know, especially herbicides and antibiotics. And so, uh, yeah, so they are pretty ubiquitous in the, in the system. And again, there are some pretty major discussions. Like, for example, in farming, is a coccidiostat an antibiotic? I'm a, I'm more of a purist and I say yes, and I have plenty of credential people that back me up, but there are big names in the industry and in the FDA that would suggest a coccidiostat is not technically an antibiotic. So you get into this parsing of the chemistry mm. and parsing of things and, and all this stuff shows up on the label. It, it's the parsing. I mean, I just, I just learned this morning that there is a huge difference between the phrase packed for and packed by. And that's something I just learned this morning in uh, shipping a product, whether it says packed by or packed for has a lot of regulatory connotations. So um, you just never know. Right. And so I'm thinking, I go to the restaurant, I order some, you know, let's say chicken Parmesan or something. That chicken doesn't have a label because it's just coming to my plate. But you're saying I may be unwittingly taking in all kinds of pharmaceuticals that I would actually never even want in my medicine cabinet in my bathroom. Yes, that's absolutely correct. That is correct. And I'll add to that, that the current stat is that roughly 70% of all of our medically important antibiotics sold in the U.S. are actually fed to the livestock and the poultry. I mean, 70% of medically important. So that means those are antibiotics that they would give to us if we had certain infections. So eating uh, doses of antibiotics in this livestock and poultry that are medically important means that you are now setting yourself up to develop antibiotic resistance to drugs. And are these animals, Joel, this is a question for you. Are these animals so sick that they have to keep pumping them with antibiotics? In in many cases, not. Although you can't, you can't put that many animals in a factory, in a factory farming situation where you have these extremely high densities over time with no rest periods, the pathogen germination rate uh, is way higher than it is (laughs) in, in, in distancing. All right. And I'm, I'm laughing because of our COVID-19 social distancing. But, but, but the fact is that when you're, when you're moving around on new ground, new places, it does break those pathogen cycles. And the same, same thing is true with animals. Mm-hmm. And so in these factory farm set settings, a lot of times, you know, the, the, the ingestion of fecal particulate, and I use that term in the book, uh, fecal particulate, it's, it's this fecal pall, you know, when you have all those hides and feathers and stuff and all that manure and urine in, in it, I mean, they're basically living in their bathroom, in their own excrement, they're eating in their own excrement, they're breathing in it. And so, you know, it's a pretty unhealthy situation. Now, what's interesting is that at least one of the largest poultry brands several years ago created a slow release antibiotic that they put in the embryo of the egg. So, so uh, for, this was to be chickens. This was for meat birds. So the egg is laid. They inject this antibiotic in it and it's in the embryo. The chick develops it. The chick catches and this antibiotic slowly releases through the life of the, um, of the chick. It was quite a, quite a scientific breakthrough. And they labeled that no antibiotics given uh, or something like that. It was, it was, a, it was a no antibiotic label. And two competitors took them to court. They went all the way, I think, to the Supreme Court. Anyway, the ruling was that that was fraudulent, even though the antibiotic was not technically administered after the chick hatched, it was still releasing into the body. And so it was given during the life of that animal. It does bring up interesting um, beginnings of life questions when the Supreme Court says that an antibiotic given in the embryo prior to hatch is given during the life of the chicken. 
<laughs> oh my gosh. What a tangled web we weave. Like, it's just crazy how, you know, the, like you said, the parsing of these details um, and the consumer is generally <laughs> ignorant on it. But let me ask you another question. So when I go out to eat then, how do I avoid antibiotics? So we have a couple of solutions in the book. One is if you're going to go to more like a fast food or a casual dining facility, there's actually a consumer's union scorecard. And this helps you find food establishments that are actively getting antibiotics out of their meat in their poultry. So every year, the consumer's union teams up with other organizations and they rank the antibiotic policies of like the 25 largest fast food and fast casual chains in the U.S., and actually, as of 2018, now they've begun releasing a second scorecard that ranks the top 25 burger chains. And so they will actually list them to you. They give them grades like A through F. Um, and it's right there on their website on consumerreports.org. And so what we say is, you know, feed the good and starve the bad, which not only applies to, you know, feeding the good microbes in your gut, right? But feeding the companies that are doing good, that are making strides to heal our food and our lands. So go to the ones that have received A's and don't go to the ones that have received F. So for instance, in, let's see, 2018, there were two that received A's among the burger chains and it was BurgerFi and um, Shake Shack. And then like Wendy's got a D minus, um, Sonic and Burger King, McDonald's, they all got F's. And even In-N-Out got F's, which coming from California, I was quite surprised. So their scorecard is a quick and easy way that you can try to avoid antibiotics at the fast food and casual chains. And then if you're going to go to a different restaurant that's not listed on there, on one of their scorecards, what we suggest is if you're already there, ask the manager. If, you, if you're not there yet, call ahead or you can, you can actually just email them if you don't want to call and ask them if the meat or the poultry was given any kinds any kind of antibiotics. And so usually what I ask is if the meat or the poultry was sourced from animals given routine antibiotics. And if they aren't, then I support that establishment with my dollars. But if they do contain antibiotics, then I tell them that once they get the antibiotics out, I'll come back to the restaurant. Like, but mm -hmm. they need to change their policy. And I'll then starve that company and go spend my money at, an establish at the establishment that's aligned with my principles of no antibiotics in my meat or poultry. I think it's very important to just add here that this has nothing to do with the size of establishments. Yes. While these folks have scored the 25 largest places, it doesn't mean that if you go to a small place that's not on this card, that it's going to necessarily be clean. Many times, the, the very smallest little places struggling to get a foothold and start are getting the very cheapest, junkiest you know, ingredients just to start. So, yeah. and, and, and it could be opposite that as well. It, it could absolutely be opposite. Anybody who knows me knows that I'm desperate to start a, a clean food, fast food franchise to go head to head with McDonald's. That would be all grass-based, pasture-based, GMO-free, you know, the real deal. There's no reason why we can't do it. I just don't have $2 million in my pocket to start it. But there is a huge need for that. But just don't, don't assume that just because you go to a very small local mom and pop place that that's going to be high quality stuff. Often it's, uh, it's not. This is not about the size of a business. It's about the policies of a business like Stephen was saying. Okay, that's helpful. And so there are things we want to avoid. And then there are things that you all emphasized in your book that we should introduce ourselves to, like actually cooking, <laughs> which is the opposite of eating out. It's eating in. And I think because of our times right now, many people have been doing more of that. Why is that a good, simple step in the right direction? Well, if, if there's one place where you can really you know, make a big difference, not only in the integrity of your food, but in the, in the price of your food, it's in getting it in as raw a state as possible. We talk about buying bulk. We talk about buying unprocessed. And when we say get in your kitchen, this is not a sexist thing. Men can be there as well, but it's also not a bondage thing. I mean, we have never had more techno glitzy things in our kitchens. We've got bread makers and, and, and hot and cold running water, time bake, Instapots, grinder mixers, you know, uh, uh, think of all the cool things that we have today. So when we say ultimately immerse yourself viscerally and practically 
in your food, it comes way, way cheaper. I mean, a lot of your listeners, I'm sure, will remember Food Inc. It was a very popular movie several years ago. They continued to move this myth forward when a family went to Burger King and they got their son this, you know, meal. And then they went to the store and they couldn't buy, they couldn't, they said they couldn't afford to get good produce. Well, goodness, I know that that here at our farm, you can get, you know, two whole pounds of world-class grass-finished uh, ground beef for less than the cost of that Burger King meal with the, you know, whatever it was, a quart of soda. And so the problem is not the total pricing, it is what we're buying with that dollar. And so if, when you buy unprocessed, you really drop the, the cost of food. I mean, right now, right now today, you can get a whole GMO, you know, pasture raised chicken here at our farm, cheaper than boneless, skinless breast at Walmart. Now you get a whole chicken, not just a boneless, skinless breast, but, but th this is the kind of thing I'm talking about is when it comes to actually, you know, the pricing out, getting unprocessed food and using your knives and your cutting boards and your oven and all that in your kitchen, it, it's a way to not only have integrity in your food, but also to be able to save a lot of money. But actually there is a cost in this, Joel, because it takes time to cook, doesn't it? It, it does, <laughs> but all of us have a certain amount of time. And what are you spending your time on? You know, Netflix and, and, what, and what's your health worth? And, and I think Cena has done a, a marvelous job in the book of teasing out that whole worth thing. Are you worth investing in? We can invest money, we can invest time, we can invest knowledge, but are you worth investing in? And, you know, if, if you if you don't think you're worth investing in, then we'll know. But uh, most of us, I think, if we really dig down, we think that we're probably worth investing in. Yeah, and I would add that we do have many time-saving tips in the book. Because as somebody, you know, I came from eating the standard American diet most of my life, which is why I got so debilitatingly sick. So switching from that diet to this whole real organic foods diet, it was a big shift for me. And I also switched using small, you know, doable baby steps. But there was this shock of how much time I'm sp I was spending in the kitchen. It got, sometimes it would be so frustrating because I'm, you know, I'm thinking I want to do other stuff. Like I want to go out and do fun stuff that my friends are doing. And, you know, so I understand what you're saying. There is that component and that mental obstacle. And part of me overcoming that is what Joel talked about, which we address in the book um, in terms of feeling worthy of it, making myself and my health a priority. However, we also provide practical tips on how to save time in the kitchen. And one of them is by like, for instance, batch cooking. And we provide recipes in the book as well to help you on this part of the journey. So I will often cook, like batch cook things in my crock pot or pressure cooker. And then I have lunch for the entire day from just cooking one, I mean, for the entire week, sorry, from just cooking one meal. Well, it depends um, on how hungry you are, because maybe it would just be for the entire day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm teasing. No, I totally get what you're saying. And the only way your book could be more practical is if it came with you, Sina and Joel, coming over to my house and helping me get these things done. Because I really... <laughs> I think it's amazing. But I do have another question, though. I'm thinking of, actually, I'm thinking of myself and friends like me, people who live in the city who are just trying to hold it together. Let's say the mom is a single mom, you know, holding down two jobs. It's all she can do to bathe her children, let alone feed them beyond labels. What advice do you have or how can we get this information out to them? I would say that it's really important for them to not beat themselves up. You know, don't expect more than you're, you're ready to give. So in other words, meet yourself where you are. And that's exactly the backbone that we built this book around. We built a continuum. So the, like on the left of the continuum is going to be, you know, the unhealthy food. That's like eating at the gas station. And all the way over to the right is going to be, you know, having your own homestead. So you get to pick your own journey. It's kind of like a choose your own adventure book in that way, is that you, you identify where you're at on the continuum and you move along the continuum one small step at a time based on what you're able to do and each small step we encourage you to praise yourself you know so if you are that mom that is like i'm just not ready to spend the money on organic i'm just not ready to cook a meal in a crock pot that's okay and there's nothing wrong with that that is where you are and so we have steps that can get you to your next step like one more step closer 
to whatever your ultimate goal is. And that may mean switching from one processed food at a time that you're eating that's conventional, switch one out at a time for the organic option, right? So it's not about changing everything all at once. You know, we think that's actually a a recipe for failure. Mm -hmm. That's expecting yourself to do too much. It's about doing what you can do in that moment and then praising yourself for making that change. I would just add that to me, and, and we write this in the book, that to me, one of the litmus tests of whatever, of, of getting this whole thing is leftovers. You know, we live in a time of single serving everything, you know, single serving packaging, single serving everything. Why? Because families don't even eat together anymore. We just kind of graze through the day. You know, I want a, I want a tidbit of this, a tidbit of that. And the time saving actually, of, as Cena said, you know, bulk cooking, but also just cooking more than you do. I mean, you talk about a a crock pot. Listen, when we put a chicken in the crock pot, this is 40, 40 watts of power. It sits there and gurgles all day while you're at work. You can even put the chicken in frozen. You don't have to put anything in with it. If it's, if it's a good chicken Uh, and, and, it, it'll just sit there all day long. And if you eat it at, uh, it's ready to eat at four o'clock, it's ready to eat at five o'clock, ready to eat at six. It never dries out, never goes bad. And it just sits there 40 watts and just, and just gurgles all day long. And then you've got leftovers for, you've got leftovers for sandwiches. You've got leftovers for casserole. You've got broth for other things. I mean, the seemingly edible expansion of something as simple as a chicken in a crock pot. And you would be amazed how many people don't even have a crock pot in their house. They got the microwave so they can, you know, nuke the little single serving hot pocket. But, you know, where's the the crock pot, which to me is the the fastest way to do a meal (laughs) is you just, you just toss it in, you leave for work, you come home at four, five, six, seven, and dinner's on the table. You don't even have to put in a separate serving dish, you know, if you've got a pretty crock pot. So (laughs) it reduces, you know, cleanup time. So, you know, th- it's just like anything. At first, something sounds really intimidating. But as Stephen said, as you start, you know, pick one item, put it on your calendar. I'm going to do a meal from scratch on Saturday night or whatever. And just pick one. And what happens is, as your skill level increases, what is intimidating today becomes just routine tomorrow. And you don't even think about it. That's what mastery does. And that's what changing routine does. I told a story to Joel that I had to have a pressure cooker, right? Like I was hearing about it on all these mommy blogs and a pressure cooker was so fantastic. So I actually like hounded my husband until he bought me a pressure cooker. (laughs) And then it sat in my pantry for six months. This item that I was like, I must have it. Like this is the key to, you know, helping me cook butter. And then it sat there for six months and it wasn't because I didn't want to use it. I did. I was intimidated. Even with my background and I'd already been cooking, I was intimidated to take it out and use it. So finally, my husband was like, "Um, are you going to use that thing? Or (laughs) So so I was like, well, you know, I guess I better use it. So I pulled it out and I'm serious. I have never looked back. I encourage everyone to get a crock pot or a pressure cooker. It helps on so many levels. And I realized it not only helped me save time, as Joel's talking about, because I can throw in my meat vegetables, my wild rice. It's a, it could be one pot to cook yeah. our entire meal. And I, either you set it for the, in the morning, like he said, if it's, if you're using the crock pot function or sometimes my, my food, I use the pressure cooker function and my dinner's ready in like 20 minutes. And all I had to do was throw it in there with some spices, you know? So not only did it save me time, but it started to save me money. It reminds me that we think fast food is fast, but it takes time to drive or to get the pizza ordered. It comes, it's 20 minutes. In that 20 minutes, we could have maybe, you know, scrambled a few eggs and and add some ferments to that. And you've got a simple, you know, breakfast for dinner kind of thing. So I really appreciate what you're saying because it's true that we get intimidated or we think we're too exhausted. And maybe if we just tweak things a little bit, we could get over that, you know, mental obstacle of being intimidated by by our own kitchen and, and really introduce ourselves to real food. So this has been an amazing conversation. I'm actually Actually really hungry, so I need to go. Um, I'm, I'm seriously really hungry. I fasted. So let me just ask you the question I always pose at the end, and maybe both of you could give your own take on it. If the listener could do one thing to improve their health, what would you recommend that they do? I don't know. Join the Weston A. Price Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> How's that for a nice shameless plug? <laughs> That's great. But maybe it could be related to your book. Maybe one step they could take that you were like, that was a great tip in that book. I wish everyone knew it. 
I'll chime in. Can I say two? <laughs> sure, go for it. Two easy things. So for me, you know, in working with clients and trying to help them reverse disease, uh, one thing that I have found to be very helpful is, you know, we're trying to reduce your toxic burden on your body. And so a simple initial step is to start, if you're, if you're eating conventional, choose organic. And I tell them to start with their meat, mm. right? So, so start by choosing an organic meat. Just that one simple step. If you're already doing that, then start by replacing your processed foods one at a time with the organic alternative, because that's going to get you away from genetically modified organisms. It's going to get you away from most pesticides and herbicides. It's going to get you away from most antibiotics. It's going to, and by the way, glyphosate, right? The one most widely used herbicide is a patented antibiotic. So when you're consuming those conventional processed foods, you are most likely ingesting small doses of antibiotics. So it's going to get you away from that. It's going to get you away from like the heavy metals, for instance, that we're finding out are present in the sewage sludge that can be used to grow conventional crops. Wow. So my first step for people is, you know, don't worry about cooking for yourself or sourcing your food differently. Just start where you're at in the grocery store and just switch from conventional to organic in any ways, any of those um, categories of foods that you can. And another easy thing is to start drinking more filtered water. You know, we have a lot of diseases that actually we're finding out that can be reversed simply from drinking enough filtered water. It's, mm. it's really unbelievable how dehydrated most of us are on a daily basis. And so if you drink enough water and it's clean water, you're reducing your toxic load and you're also giving yourself life through the energetic properties of the water. Good point. Thank you for that. Joel, do you want to add anything? Perhaps now that I've had a little more time to think, I would say just eliminate Coca-Cola and Mountain Dew and all those sugary, sugary drinks. You know, a lot of that gets consumed. I'm amazed at how many gallons of that. And I'm amazed that in a time of COVID-19 and the pandemic, when we're all having discussions about immunology, I can't believe that I'm still seeing the Pepsi-Cola truck travel down the road. Why doesn't somebody step up to the microphone and say, okay, everybody, we're going we're gonna to talk about building immune systems. So let's put a moratorium for a week on drinking sugary drinks. And um, seems like that would be a, and then if you substitute that with good filtered water and get properly hydrated and get the sugar out, uh, you might be surprised how you feel. But Joel, nobody makes any money off of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that that's the problem. That's, that's the problem. But that, that's one of the reasons why it doesn't get traction. But um, if, if there if there's one thing that I see, I mean, I just can't, I mean, there, there's obvious things like, you know, stop smoking. Yeah. Uh, but but to me, the, the fact that there are just you know, millions and millions and millions, we have a... Um, a little Debbie plant here in the county, and they use more than a million pounds of sugar a week <gasps> through that through that one plant. More than a million pounds of sugar a week, and they have several plants. And so this this let me tell you these these little ho ho cakes and sugary snacks and drinks, mm. they're they're like they're poison. They're just oh. they're just poison. Well, we're going to um, have another podcast on that. Actually, I'm interviewing, I've, I've interviewed Robert Lustig. I don't know if you've heard of him. And he goes on and on about sugar because it really is compromising our immune system and probably making us more vulnerable to sickness and disease, obviously, right? Sure. But thank you guys so much. This has been amazing. I can't wait for folks to pick up your book and for everybody to go beyond labels. So thanks again for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Our guests today were Joel Salatin and Dr. Sina McCullough. Visit their websites, polyfacefarms.com and handsoffmyfood.com for more information and resources. And I'm Hilda Labrada Gore. Visit my website, holistichilda.com. And for the show notes for this and every podcast episode, visit our website, westonaprice.org and click on the podcast page. And now for a review from Apple Podcasts. Fantastic and super informative. This is a review from I Enjoy Podcasts A Lot. She says, I'm so thankful I found this podcast and have learned so much from it. Please keep up the great work and teaching. It's so, so helpful and valuable. And the interviews and topics are so interesting. My husband and I are contemplating starting a family soon, and I'm thankful to be learning some of the wise traditions ways before that. Thank you so much. I enjoy podcasts a lot. We really appreciate this review. And feel free to rate and review our show on Apple Podcasts as well, or write us a letter that we might include it in an upcoming journal. And that's it. Thank you so much for listening. 
Take care. Hasta pronto. On behalf of the Weston A. Price Foundation, thanks for listening. We have many free resources to support you on your health journey. Visit WestonAPrice.org to find podcasts, articles, videos, and more. You can also find a local chapter near you for help in finding sources of great food. We invite you to support the Foundation's mission of education, research, and activism by becoming a member. Thanks again, and take care. Wise Traditions is a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. The content on this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professional. It is not intended to be, nor does it constitute healthcare or medical advice.